Hello everyone, today we talk about the Thessalonian army during the 14th and the 15th century. Thessalonica, Thessaloniki, however you want to call it, was a relevant polity in late medieval Greece, endowed with a certain spirit and uh, capacity of autonomization that uh, had uh, already been displayed actually in previous centuries, uh, even the ones probably which uh, Thessaloniki was within the, the Byzantine Empire as well. Essentially, after Constantinople, Thessalonica was the only veritable city in the empire, the other being towns having decayed, say the, the ancient Hellenic urbanism having profoundly deteriorated uh, since late antiquity and especially um, since the, the Islamic conquests, um, also because of the centralistic, let's say, uh, draining that Constantinople made of the of the entire system. Well, Thessalonica was the only veritable center that at some point had a capacity to autonomize uh, itself uh, without too much success and without actually developing any, uh, say, important military power, as we will see now, the Thessalonian forces are fundamentally pretty scarce, and the city depends still on other powers, right, for its defense, um, even when uh, nominally ruled by the Byzantines. But this was exactly uh, the same point. This is not a city like, I don't know, one in Basia or this other sort of, you know, smaller centers that want to imitate a bit like the Italian maritime republics. Um, it's truly a city controlling the major resources of Thessaly, in part, as you see from the maps that I inserted here, uh, really stretching uh, south, uh, in fact, managing to control centers like Demetrius and Almiros, and even some um, some islands in, in the northern and central Aegean. Mount um, Athos was, for example, under Thessalonica. Uh, and so um, this was a bit more than a... It wasn't actually a fully-fledged city-state to begin with, right? It was more like a, a city ruled by, of course, an oligarchy that had vast possessions, uh, in the in the countryside and as part especially of some sort of greater Byzantine government that aside from the intermittence in actual existence uh, in the area was in fact a much more hierarchical one right uh, but being the major center um, in the in the in the province and having such again lack of other competitors on the same scale, it was an important cornerstone for whoever, in fact, wanted to control that very, uh, that very land, right? We will see this uh, in part, right? The, of course, Thessaly was just like, for example, Epirus at some point, uh, an independent uh, reality, right? After the Fourth Crusade, the disaggregation of the broader empire, and regardless of the fact that uh, the, for example, the same Epirotes would manage to, to extend control on Thessalonica or, of course, the, the emperors of Constantinople, um, there was an obvious degree of, uh, of autonomy. I'm also preparing a, a video about uh, probably the Catalan... Uh, organization in Greece, that is not to say properly the Catalan company that I already made a video on, but also, and especially in this case, the rest of the Aragonese presence uh, in Greece. We will be doing this with, with other powers. I made a video in general about the Latin Empire. I have to re-upload at least with um, renewed pictures. Uh, a video made on the Latin army organization. I recently made a video about properly Latin warfare in the Levant in, in Greece, right? So there is actually a lot to dig in. It was the, the video about Pelagonia, the Battle of Pelagonia. So we are beginning to, there is probably a playlist called Medieval Greece that includes all these other sort of, um, you know, situations 
uh, outside of the Byzantine Empire proper, right? So as a regional uh, series uh, in turn. As we will learn, of course, uh, Thessalonica does not go very far um, in its autonomy, but it's relevant because it was also an important um, center of uh, arms and armor production, at least to some extent. We've seen in the video about the 14th century Byzantine cavalrymen, how the finest silken lining used by these soldiers came from Thessalonica. There were elites, right? We'll see them uh, now also living on, by the way, after the the Ottoman conquest, uh, the final Ottoman conquest uh, in the 15th century. And the Voynitsi of Slavic and Greek origin that were actually men at arms. Um, and this is valid, by the way, also for the Thessalonian interland as far as uh, war horse breeding was concerned. The Thessalian cavalry, as you know, has uh, uh, an old reputation uh, the Thessalian horses, uh, especially in this case, um, I made a video about uh, the Thessalian horsemen in antiquity, in the classical and Hellenistic era, uh, respectively. Uh, but such traditions, of course, of mounted warfare have partially continu continued in this in this Aegean uh, plains. So we're looking, of course, uh, at, a, at a center endowed with uh, significant, uh, not just political autonomy, but economical productivity. Uh, late medieval Greece, the, the Byzantine Empire, as well as you know, is not uh, very um, competitive as far as its economy goes. The Italians basically control the entire, nearly the, all the, the maritime uh, routes, and uh, from the same from the same occupied Greece, as we will see now, there is a Venetian involvement in the same uh, Thessalonica by also Byzantine um, will uh, to fight again jointly against the Turks. But let's say there there had been in, in in a few centers, in fact, an imitation of the same Italian banking practices that um, again, when run by the Greeks, uh, there were course not capable of given the the general nature of Byzantine culture and society to become that say powerful at this point also the empire was somewhat broken but it had always been sort of very um, um, oligarchically sclerotized as far as the the great landowners um, of the Balkan interland were were, were concerned um, there was no much, uh, and this this is true also after the, the Ottoman conquest, a great deal of uh, economical uh, vivacity or effervescence compared to the West, at least. In fact, as you know, the Greeks under the Ottomans would be the more dynamic um, uh, commercial uh, uh, nationality together with the Jews. And uh, so looking at a general culture was quasi feudal um, in nature, right? But Thessalonica would be exactly the sea of this greater economical uh, activity in, in the Byzantine world, aside from Constantinople uh, herself. There were other smaller centers on the sea, on the Black Sea, in the Aegean, that were so in the Ionian, that were similar in that, but again, there the Venetian, the Genoese presence. Uh, is preponderant and basically does not allow for much of a uh, of a of a development in the first place. On the contrary, there is a great dependence uh, on the same markets, and so in part the Greeks act as middlemen for this bigger uh, bigger businessmen. Now, um, so we are definitely today talking of the post twelve oh four. We talk probably about, about the 14th and the 15th century. So this is an advanced stage of further, because of the mid-14th century crisis, etc., further oligarchization of the system. Thessalonica would have reflected that as far as the compaction of some sort of, um, again, city elite, patriciate, would have concerned. We do not know too much uh, about uh, these men from a strictly military point of view. But we can imagine, of course, being there some, even, I don't know, sm 
small, very small, as we'll see now, contingents of cavalry that would participate um, with this, you know, high quality, but uh, especially accompanied by troops that would come from the Thessalian interland that had some horsemanship at this point, as we've seen in the videos about um, Eastern Balkan warfare, at this point heavily influenced by the Turks, the Mongols. So when you look at Thessalian or Bul Bulgar cavalry, such as the one that um, in 1302, uh, Guy II de la Roche, the Duke of Athens, where essentially this is the Principality of Achaia, um, looks, um, I mean, brings um, together with, um, uh, say, from the local, from the local levies, plus 900 Frankish uh, men-at-arms, um, we see 6,000 Thessalian and Bulgar cavalry, under, by the way, 18 Greek archontes, um, and uh, again, the, the infantry is counted in 30,000. Uh, we will look at this expedition perhaps better in another bit, and also we'll talk about um, the Catalan involvement um, Montaner also has a source like how the Iberians describe at times these I mean, we've, we've seen it in, in the video about Pelagonia in part right? but the point being here that um, as we've said ex exactly in that video there is some sort of heavier western cavalry there is really the feudal one that is uh, grafted into Greece um, and this lighter um uh, mounted force from the Balkan interland. And as you know, historically had been uh, partly Slavicized and it, it had been looking uh, lighter. It had always been lighter since, um, uh, let's say, uh, antiquity, aside from, from Macedon, that had developed like veritable uh, feudal cavalry in, in that heavy sense. And also the Thessalians had almost come participated in that, as you know. Um, and in fact, their elites not being that the different, but in the later times, this this interland had uh, impoverished and sort of uh, depleted itself. And you have, however, these are contests that would be the equivalent of the um, local, let's say, the, the Western uh, lords, the Western barons that um, were, uh, as you know, uh, provided with a, a pronoia thief basically uh, and that in fact uh, about not being in fact really a, a fully few say a, a feudal society at least of the level of the the latins still had this again core of heavier cavalry and this sort of medium we could call at least by the degree of armored defense that included were also skirmishers horse archers um, there's especially a, a great collapse, needless to say, after 1204. As we've seen, many Greeks um, went um, over to even the Levant, starting to serve as um, Turcopolo, which at the time was a synecdoche uh, for horse archers uh, in, in this broader, at, at this point, Latin context as a matter of fact we've seen them in a lot of in, in cyprus in the same uh, in the same holy land before it completely fell uh, to to the mamluks uh and within the same greece of course um why because of course there is a socio-economical collapse this is true for other um regions of mediterranean at, at this point because of major wars upheavals i don't know the the war the sicilian vespers causes a similar issue and so there are lots of poor young people that uh, have nothing to lose, and so they start uh, thickening the ranks of um, uh, other, say, of the great of the warlords that are rising. In a moment of, at this point, actually peak of medieval civilization, but also of collapse of these other, some other systems, and that are in fact heading towards a professional, a broader professionalization. And since, however, they are fundamentally poor, they cannot provide with this dramatically uh, developed type of warfare. They, they are light troops uh, uh, at large, and they also fight alongside lots of, again, external peoples, including the, the very Turks, 
Uh, we see people coming from the Pontic steppe, nomads proper. And so that Eastern Balkan warfare, especially in the last two centuries of the Middle Ages, is heavily, but I mean heavily, influenced by Turkish and Mongol uh, tactics. All right, Not just because there are literally Turks and Mongols um, in the Balkans um, serving in these armies, but because the local type of warfare that, as you know, in the Byzantine world had always been sort of lighter compared to the West, uh, at this point has become ever lighter in in terms of, of, of numbers, of proportions, because, again, that bulk also of sort of middle class, if you can so say, that had uh, maintained, uh, had survived to some degree in the Byzantine Empire, very scarcely compared to the West, collapses, and so there is an even wider gap. There is an increase, a collapse in public authority. There is a, an increase. Uh, an extensive level of privatization, of further feudalization, which is essentially what the Latins bring themselves uh, as a model that has basically overrun this this one. And so normally um, you have these Westerners coming from places like Germany, France, um, etc., that Sicily, uh, yeah, you name them, uh, that uh, are the heavy guys, are probably the Frankish model of, of cavalry, feudal, um, and uh, you have the locals that are something else, that tend to blend this sort of Greek, Byzantine, Slavic, also partly Turkic um, kind of warfare. You find the Kumans, you find the, the Vlachs, you find, again, the old peoples that we will gradually uh, illustrate in their uh, arms and armor, historical unit types, etc., but that we have already had the, the chance of sort of observing in general sometimes more in depth but you know say structurally the differences between the various European regions by following Schwerpunkt's by display and they're macroscopical right there's also the adventure of Stefan Urosh the fort Dushan that uh, from Serbia basically takes over this enormous amount of territories essentially with Macedonia, Albania, Epirus, uh, Thessaly, right, right, and so um, by the mid 14th century, manifesting yet another influence next to the the one of the Grand Catalan companies that are in these lands that are really crossed by so many uh, so many peoples and uh, without much of a local bulwark that could really stop them. Um, Thessalonica, however, had uh, an advantage in this uh, that is an infrastructural one since Roman times and uh, with later Byzantine fortifications. Uh, it stemmed from a pretty solid city, the nucleus of which, as we've seen, did not decline. It sort of preserved itself at least as an um, as important uh, fortress altogether throughout the uh, Middle Ages. The same could be said for uh, Chalcidica. Uh, Greece was all sort of fortified to a degree that the Latins added heavily to that. As you know, there are plenty of Frankish castles uh, in Greece. They're beautiful architectures, later developed by the, the Ottomans or the Venetians, uh, or both for that matter. Um, and so witnessing also the, the, the frontier uh, area that Greece had become, uh, its militarization, its uh, sort of uh, re revolution around the uh, the, the strongholds, in uh, as a consequence of the fragmentation of of the Byzantine Empire, that truly had had its own fortifications, but tended also to to prevent um, local private forces simply autonomize uh, themselves with that strong um, hold from uh, Constantinople. Um, this, um, I mean, Thessalonica, together with the St. Chalcidice, uh, had remained as a strong city in Byzantine hands since its recapture from the Franks in 1224. Um, it was not recovered by the Nicenes, but by the Epirotes. You, you want to bear that in mind, even though later, of course, they are also with the reconquest of Constantinople. Uh, the Palaiologans come to, to control the city, uh, once again, um, there had, as you know, properly been a Frankish kingdom of Thessalonica, right? These were the 
uh, uh, parcels of uh, Romania that, that the Latins had um, carved out as literally individual uh, princely, say personal princely possessions by the especially the, the French crusaders. The Venetians had the, had the right uh, after 1204 to an important part of the empire. They said, no, we, we keep the ports only, which was in many ways an intelligent thing to do, at least for, for, for a maritime republic um, that didn't have many uh, continental um, territorial expansion interests. Um, the Franks, as you know, the, the Latin Empire does not have a very long nor particularly thrilling uh, life because they basically get um, annihilated in battle against the Bulgarians just shortly after 1204. But uh, it's not really true that uh, the, the Frankish fe feudalism was just incompatible with these um, Eastern realities in Greece as in, in the Near East. Um, the, the, if anything, it was a lack of commitment from the Western side, uh, more than else. It was surely like pretty uh, disorderly and uh, you know pre pretty predatory uh, attitude, especially towards uh, Romania, the way it had fallen. You know what happened to the Saint Constantinople was largely the spoil of its treasures. Also, in fact, what uh, the Franks managed was sort of. Um, bit of a uh, bit of a disaster uh, the venetians were again the, the clever ones by bringing all the works of art you know in their pre-humanistic uh insight uh back to to italy and still you can observe them in, in venice uh today uh, out there um the uh however the the general breakthrough that the west had uh succeeded and can equally not be um let's say denied uh without mentioning that it was full of westerners in the byzantine empire way before uh 1204 properly as soldiers as military colonists as far as anatolia some of them were absorbed later by by the ottomans even in a non necessarily violent um way so the akrita you know that there is a a level of let's say secular byzantine culture which Technically, it's not Byzantine by definition because Byzantine culture is exclusively ecclesiastical in nature. There's no such thing like Byzantine music in terms of lay music or whatever. That's just like church stuff. Um, and you have, of course, like also some courtly standards, etc. Um, but you can see how um, Western culture has been spreading at practically all levels, including, of course, um, the one of arms. Uh, and armor. We have seen very often like Byzantine um, panoplies from, from this time. You observed how much Western influence there was next to, again, the, the Turkic, the, the Mongol one. Um, the, um, after the mid 14th century, when uh, the Ottoman conquests cut Thessalonica off from Constantinople because they properly, the Turks, Across the the straits, they uh, they swarm into, uh, in fact, what they call Romania, Romania, and uh, by land, so cutting off the, the contacts with with the capital, uh, Thessaly. Uh, Thessalonica depended principally on the strength of its massive walls for defense, which was essentially also most what it could do. They could essentially apply the, the Ottoman sieges of Constantinople, of the, also of Constantinople, but um, of its Theodosian walls. Uh, but also in the case of Thessalonica were massive feats of um, logistical training um, and ingenuity, right? This, this, this city, Thessalonica in particular, was very well, uh, was the, the largest again after Constantinople. And um, had it been just like Constantinople, properly manned, like it would have created even greater complications to, to the Turks, right, um, that were not really meant to simply take over everything, just in a deterministic sense. The Westerners, even after the fall of Constantinople, had the chance after Belgrade, for example, for the 56 to just uh, march to Constantinople again, this is true also for later times, but it always sort of just get the defeatistic 
uh, criticism about uh, what, yes, of course, what was the point? The Westerners didn't do much, right? If, if they had done it in, you know, spending part of their, the, the forces that were using to kill one another against the Turk, of course, it would have been a completely different story, but that's the point. Uh, the political balance did not prioritize that, and perhaps it was even you know, positive to, to some other extent. In any case, let's always stress the fact it was the Greeks that opened uh, the gates of not just Constantinople, but as we'll learn now, of Thessalonica to the Turks. You have this paradox that basically the Latins come to defend, actually do come to defend. I mean, there is, there is uh, Nicopolis, there is Varna, but there is properly like a Western presence, as you know, as meager as it was in Constantinople, in Thessalonica, in other parts of the Byzantine Empire. But paradoxically, it was the Greeks that accepted, as it was said at the time, the, the, the Ottoman turban to the Papal Tiara, which does not seem also, by the way, a great deal of a, uh, of a choice. Uh, but again, you, you exactly because the Westerners were not interested too much uh, in the East, at this point, you're making the effort of clashing against the Turks properly. Also, the Byzantines said, you know what, uh, it's better to be under these guys. Um, that, after all, were seeking for some, uh, there were many ways we will see, brutal, right? Uh, Thessaly, um, sources from Thessalonica are some of the first to document the famous Devshirme, levy of children and youths, uh, forcibly imposed on the Sultan's Christian subjects. But at the same time, aside from the fact that the Greeks specifically and the Greeks of the cities were the uh, most co-opted um, elite within within the Ottoman Empire, having roles out there, ruling also over some uh, Ottoman vassal states out there in the Balkans, in Central Europe, um, they um, uh, they found greater stability in this. Like the, the Turks wanted essentially to, to get as much consensus as possible. Um, and overall, that's how the, the the thing actually happened. And we'll come back on the topic um, in other videos. However, indeed, um, this had not been an immediate or univocal attitude. Initially, of course, the Byzantines did fight back. And Thessalonica, uh, in this sense, shows us, that's the reason why I make this video, um, its own military organization. Actually, the Thessalonian armed forces were very small. Um, it's not, as you know, Schwerpunkt has a, an encyclopedic uh, interest, like to properly uh, depict, um, describe the entire medieval warfare in detail. So Thessalonica existed for that reason. We might, the, the, the military information that we are aware of, um, uh, we, we must cover it. Um, it's uh, the, the smallest of the Thessalonian forces is still, again, politically interesting for how, as we've seen, it was integrated by other forces at a point and uh, what, how it worked like. Um, in, in 1371, for example, um, the economical necessities to have a up to the task uh, military force uh, to protect for the protection of the city brought to the necessity of converting half of the property of the aforementioned monasteries of Mount Athos as well as the one of Thessalonica into pronoiae. In other words, they were selling them to some privates that had to provide with some kind of contribution. Uh, that the church had historically been exempt of. Um, and so uh, this was uh, an important source uh, of, say, payment for, for the troops. Plus, uh, a tax was introduced um, uh, the, uh, on the, the rest of, uh, the, on the actual church, in order to strengthen the city's defenses further. Right. So these were actually very desperate provisions, because normally... Byzantine society was more obsequious towards um, ecclesiastical immunities, but hey, that, that's uh, what a critical of, of a moment it really is. In spite of this, Thessalonian forces would still be limited 
in size. In 1384, the Thessalonian governor and so-called emperor, Manuel II, who was the son of the actual emperor John V, could uh, field only 100 cavalrymen, um, at least according to one source. Uh, we should point out that 100 horsemen was not the entirety of the Thessalonian mounted uh, strength, at least think uh, that would have been surely larger. 100 horsemen, just sometimes even what a town could, could put together. And of course, like you, you don't have to um, imagine as we don't know too much about these guys. Um, but there would be infantry uh, as well. Such forces would not be enough, however. In 1385, the same Manuel was obliged to request 70 mercenary crossbowmen and 200 suits of armor from Venice uh, for the purpose of the Thessalonian defense. Um, this is interesting because crossbowmen, as we will see, were apparently not that um, uh, much in, um, in available in, in the same Thessalonica, at least we will see that was not a great um, will to participate even to the defense of the city uh, against the Ottomans when the Venetians will come actually to, to rule uh, in the same city. Um, Italy is also um, at the forefront for arms and armor production, uh, so the Venetians um, sell this. We've seen a lot of, uh, uh, of Western, of Italian, German panoplies all over, um, especially the Western Balkans, but even in here, especially through the Italian maritime net, like um, very, very far away. I made a video. Uh, about the Italians, the Ottomans, and the Tartars, probably in the Black Sea, for the Eurasian Steps Warfare series that documents how far, of course, um, these Westerners could come fighting uh, and influencing this area. It had all been part of the broader Byzantine, some people would say Commonwealth, that uh, was the, an empire, let's be honest, about this, but as a broader sort of cultural area, especially the coastal cities of uh, the black uh, and the agencies, right? You know, they, you know, it was they were affected, were dominated by such um, such Italian uh, um, uh, naval power more uh, than else. Um, the Ottomans captured Thessalonica in 1387, holding it until 1403, uh, when it was returned to the Byzantine. It was complicated at that time to control it. The Ottomans had, as you know, big troubles uh, in Anatolia, including the Tartars and an Ottoman civil war that risked uh, to, for, from their side, actually to, to wipe them out entirely. Um, it, it, it's incredibly, um, uh, it's only an incredibly late that the Ottomans really managed to pose to affirm themselves as a stable uh, regional power. And largely the reason why they sort of resurrected was the same, not just uh, Western, not just apathy, but actually even support properly to, um, to at least one, the, the prevailing um, faction in the Ottoman civil war that would allow this regrowth to, to occur. And in their defense, actually at the time, nobody could really tell um, that Constantinople would have fallen to the Turks uh, that easily because... The balance of power was so complicated that it was really and literally unpredictable. Just it would be similarly um, today. We just know what happened later, but they didn't, and they were handling the thing in an actually positive way. We'll come back uh, on the Balkans, on on Anatolia uh, during this period because it's sometimes a really misunderstood history. Um, the Thessalonian last governors were uh, the future Emperor John the Seventh between 1403 and 1408, then Demetrius Leontares from 1408 to 1415, and one of Manuel II's sons, Andronikos Palaiologos, uh, between 1415 
and 1423. Um, during uh, this period, of course, we, we do not know too much about what the, in detail, like the Thessalonian military organization really was. I'm sure that there are specialistic studies of some sort, like looking at the thing a bit more in depth. But the highlights are that the Ottomans come back knocking at the door, uh, uh, virtually besieging uh, Thessalonica uninterruptedly between 1422 and 1430. This is when the aforementioned Andronikos Palaiologos decides that Thessalonica costs too much for the imperial coffers and so that the Venetians can defend it better. This sort of did make sense because the Byzantines really were out of money, that this was a, a terrible situation. Uh, we will, if anything, discuss specifically on another occasion. Uh, the Venetians were more affluent. They didn't see probably, like, again, the control of Thessalonica in particular, any major game changer situation. It was an important um, uh, translation of power, but um, the, the situation was starting to be very uh, heavy and compromised. After all, the Venetians themselves had started losing um, outposts to the Ottomans during the same wars. So what the Venetians do is to put a garrison of 700 crossbowmen in 1426 uh, at the defense of the city. Uh, crossbowmen, we've seen them before the Byzantines had asked Venice for, for those uh, as well. Uh, crossbow fire basically was the most uh, adequate uh, existing at the time. Uh, we haven't talked too much about 15th century Italian warfare, but we'll have to come back prepotently on the topic for that matter. And of course, in siege warfare, crossbows were sort of the best um, in defense. Um, they were used, actually, I'm writing something just right now about this, but incidentally, um, also in attack, but um, the Ottomans, if anything, had just superior numbers. They had say that their archery was the, the prevalent missile type of warfare aside from the artillery to smash the walls and so on. The Italians had quite advanced crossbow say technical um, background. They uh, the, this this men were professionals by themselves at this point the fifteenth century, as you know, European warfare in general tends towards the level of professionalism. Um, and uh, so these were salaried troops in Venice just deployed in this fortress um, on the sea. That's how they were habituated to, to operate in the first place. That's somehow sound. Like they were saying, okay, let's take the city and see what happens uh, in the meanwhile. Um, in fact, um, they would add to this garrison um, also the crews of any of their galleys that happened to be anchored in the harbor. Um, five in the same 1426 and 3 in 1430. Uh, this is relevant because the uh, the Venetian marines were themselves like again a uh, formidable fighting force you know that warfare was about boarding uh, fighting on the enemy decks as if you had been you know uh, in battle even with actually with an actually increased level of individual uh, prowess because of course uh, the space was not uh, that large. I made a video about Venetian naval forces uh, during this point. We'll come back on it a bit more in depth because the Italians in particular do have all this kind of sort of um, marines uh, forces that they specialize in because of their, in fact, naval development of maritime uh, involvement. We'll surely uh, addressed in our unit types videos. In 1430 uh, you have the final fall of Thessalonica into the hands of the Turks and uh, Dukas, such a crucial source, right, this was the biographer of Constantine the Ninth Palaiologus living at his court, you know, this was the last um, Byzantine emperor uh, Ducas witnessed the fall of Constantinople. I mean, it's such an excellent source. We 
uh, at least for just the historical context, uh, we have used it for uh, the Ottomans as well. You know, the, the Ottoman army, uh, because of what we're describing before, essentially regarding Ottoman society and cultural temper, would not produce this chronicles like the Westerners, even the same Byzantines, who were a bit more stylistic in nature, but still did, all right? At this point, by the way, Byzantine historiography is, is sort of um, uh, unhinging itself from its rigid conservatism. It's starting to appreciate also a bit the, uh, in fact, the humanistic uh, trend that uh, actually has been flourishing in the West, uh, contrary to first to, to, to what people normally believe that the renaissance was just because some uh, greek refugee brought his library from Constantinople to to italy that's not really how it worked um it's these people were sort of opening their minds in general um and starting to describe history in a bit more of a critical and sort of developed way like mostly again the west uh had began to do overwhelmingly to influence the same Byzantines uh, in this. And um, Dukas tells us um, about the fall of, uh, of the Salonica in a way that is a bit disconcerting. First of all, it says that its defenders were outnumbered 100 to 1. It seems that the deprivations suffered by the local populace um, during this, again, very long siege lasting almost uh, eight years had shrank the, the size of the city from 40,000 um, to 2,000 uh, inhabitants. But the, the sense is the general desolation you can appreciate also for Constantinople 1453 of the lack of defenders, probably of the will to resist uh, and more. So it's said that um, in, in, the, in Dukas that in 10 terrorists there was just one crossbow and defending them. Probably it's an exaggeration, but we don't have to, um, say, imagine a particularly, um, uh, again, robust defense. From another source, we know that the Venetians had recurred to draconian measures to actually um, motivate the local population to resist, meaning that they had put, as we've seen, their own uh, force, but the Thessalonians were not particularly fond of the idea of resisting. And so there is sort of dark unit, the Getari uh, in Latin, that uh, apparently were uh, pretty much like scumbag, cutthroat mercenaries that the, the Venetians had found some way. Uh, and they had the specific task next to the, um, of course, like sort of more professional troops of Venice uh, had sent, and other adventurers, by the way, because this is true also at Constantinople, many troops were also there. These were, for example, Genoese, uh, other Westerners that had seniors in the agenda, they didn't want to lose them to, to the Ottomans, so they sort of armed uh, through their own possessions um, units, right, just to participate uh, to the siege. But these Jothari are interesting because they are basically interspersed by the Venetians among the Thessalonian uh, population at large, um, and all, including the local native Thessalonian militia that existed, as obviously in any community, with the precise task to slaughter any one who would show any sort of um, sign of betrayal or you know, lack of, uh, say, will to surrender. Right. So, in other words, that it was the Venetians were pouring the Thessalonians to resist other, uh, rather than the other way around, which tells you again what, like how the Ottoman conquests really happened, right? The Greeks, basically. When in this case they were exhausted, they had resisted for a long time, but in general, right, they opted for the Turks rather than increasing uh, resistance uh, to that, right? We know that during the siege of Thessalonica, the Ottomans, of course, used their artillery, made multiple videos about Ottoman warfare and even the probably artillery this time. We do not have uh, artillery recorded among the defenders, but at this point uh, is irrealistic to presume that there wasn't. 1430 is uh, admittedly not such um, a late date to see a widespread use of gunnery 
especially heavy calibers out there. Of course, the Venetians had hand gunners and surely some, some cannon. Because during siege warfare you must have it's all very specular, and so again the fact that you don't have a mention explicitly doesn't, doesn't actually mean anything. Again, the Ottomans have to, in spite of this apparent lack of strenuous resistance, an enormous um, effort uh, strategically, logistically to seize Thessalonica. As you've seen, the siege actually lasted that long. So uh, perhaps we will make a more detailed video regarding the siege can understand better um, what happened. Um, so at this point Thessalonica falls into Ottoman hands for for good, at least for a very long time in history, uh, as you know. And um, what actually happens in Thessaly is with the participation of some, uh, of course, Thessalonian noblemen um, in, the, in the process, is the participation of local men at arms proper to uh, Ottoman to the Ottoman army, right? We talked about Ottoman auxiliaries in general, so this is a bit of an exp further exploration of that. We we'll have about this topic to to be a bit more uh, to go a bit more in depth. However, essentially, the, the name of um, uh, Voynitsi, right? We'll talk about this also in a particular. Um, uh, historical unit video because they they had a particular physiognomy in this late medieval context. The term comes from Serbian, and so it was uh, used just because it was like this major Slavic power resisting the Ottomans at this point, and uh, eventually, like in the Slavic tongues of the Balkans, still being found in similar ways. That that, however, in, um, included people coming a bit from everywhere in this area, like Albania, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Herzegovina, Macedonia, Serbia, herself, and Thessaly, all right? Um, I will not digress again on the, the historical blend that had occurred in the Balkan interland uh, between, say, the locals and the Slavs historically, and uh, again, this had, during the migration era, arrived up to the Peloponnese, even reached Africa from Greece, um, on boats, and uh, that's not the thing. What, what I would like to stress, if anything, is how radically separated um, the Hellenic urban coastal reality was for millennia from just a few tens of kilometers in the, inter in the interland. Notoriously. Like, the Greeks always lived exclusively in that kind of dimension. Right, the idea of a territoriality of power in a continental sense was completely alien to Hellenic culture in, in an absolute sense. Whoever lived there were barbarians, and this was actually true both in classical times and in the Middle Ages. Of course, things changed in, by, by some degree, but that sense of uh, Byzantine haughtiness and sort of, uh, again, the crystallized um, cultural standards had to do with this radical separation, except, again, uh, these people now were not part, um, they were still part of the world, and so when you look at the Voynitsi, um, there were also the Yamaks, um, so-called, like, in, um, among especially the Balkan Christian foot soldiery that the Ottomans used, but there were these other, probably lower, say, Men at arms, if anything, they were sort of mercenaries that had essentially went at war uh, in exchange for certain tax exemptions. Uh, that's how they performed the duty. So it was different from just, you know, um, just a direct levy or coal. And so this tells you also the degree of private power that had um, remained, even maybe among some Greek ar archons in the in the countryside ruling on again this other people's coming mostly instead from a aristocrat Byzantine aristocratic background and um, these troops are now part of the Ottoman army they fight alongside it and uh, it's uh, just this is just an anecdote but the actual first um, source talking ever about the the Shirme is the uh, is a sermon dating to 1395 
uh, by the Bishop Isidore Glabas of Thessalonica, which, as we've seen, was now in Turkish hands. Right. There are, uh, again, these are mostly anecdotes, just to, to give you an idea of the general background. Of course, there is a bit more to it. There's a bit more also of the Thessalonian uh, involvement um, in, in all this contexts before and after the Ottoman conquest, except especially in the second part, uh, you have much less information. And even before, not too much, as you understand from the local. Like We, we don't have too much uh, information about this. Had it been, again, a, a Western city, we would know so much. The Byzantine world was that drier in terms of sources of information. It was a much more oligarchic world. And the Saint Thessalonica, in this sense, should be understood not much as a, as a republic, right? But say, some sort of oligarchically ruled... Yes, it's similar to, to a republic, if you want to call it that way. But And Thessalonica naturally had cultivated part of that liberty and rep republicanism, if you want, um, exactly to oppose itself, to, even to compete, to some extent, with Constantinople uh, when possible. But um, this doesn't change. Of course, the Byzantines did not have culturally any kind of that sort of republican ethos at all. Like, they were violently uh, oligarchic and reactionary uh, and sort of close to any form of change. So what they were doing um, in this sense uh, was just gradually adapting to, to as you understand here, it's a pretty dramatic situation. Uh, but one that still was um, possibly exploitable, yet depending fundamentally on external powers. Right. What, what is interesting here is naturally to consider the connection between this old city elite and the, the, uh, the Thessalian countryside. Because as we said before, also as far as that strip of territory that you've seen in the map that basically connects uh, Thessalonica with uh, the, say, even for with cities further south uh, in tens of kilometers um, and con allows it also to control some lands in the gen, etc. You you have some actual control. It's not like a very strong one or whatever. It's mostly a matter of juridical pertinence. As we've seen, there are, this especially the coastal dimension is dominated by Venice, by Genoa. And you have, in fact, all these other settlements, like the Salon, it's, it's really not even this lodge. But there is a coastal control, right? Uh, these people did not care fundamentally much about uh, the, the interland, places like, I don't know, Ceres, or Vodena, Veroia, Serbia, Larissa, etc. And this is also, in fact, the, the boundary that initially is drawn with the Ottoman Empire. Right. The Ottomans do conquer some coastal areas, of course, uh, throughout, like along the, the, the Aegean, etc. But most of the uh, independent Byzantine or uh, Italian or whichever other power existed uh, at that point um, in, in Greece is fundamentally maintaining the coastal control. And this is almost crazy when you think that, especially the Thessalian interland, was sort of taken over. So the border of Romania, right, was taken over by the Turks. And you have literally this, you see, you can see it in the in the major picture um, uh, that I posed that towards like half of the video, first half of the video, uh, that this interland enters this sort of surrounded by this coastal dimension so that basically the interland was con more easily controllable by the Turks or siding with the Turks that these um, uh, coastal centers were much more difficult to seize. Right? In other words, the Ottomans could swarm into Romania not even just with massive armies but even with the raiders around and seizing this continental uh, uh, dimension and still the coasts holding out, even though 
in some trades there wasn't, and especially in Thessalonica is the case of this, they didn't have any other major center in between. Like between Thessalonica and Demetrius, it's, it's a long way, but it's not, like, there isn't any major, um, even any major valley. Like, yes, there is something, but it's, uh, it's not even a very structured place. It's like, uh, but still, right, you have other, these islands, for example, the Palme Palamedica Telusios, once close to the Dardanelles, you have the St. Gattelusius, for example, controlling uh, Mytilene, uh, you know, very close at hand places that, however, the Ottomans did not quite have the capacity to simply seize. And this is to stress how actually hampered um, the Ottomans were up to very late in time, um, in essentially forging a power almost out of nothing and mostly telling the truth of Byzantine-based reality because that's where uh, the, the Ottomans were born as a power, Bursa, Bithynia, the Marmara uh, Sea. Um, it's just next door, it, it's within the, the Roman world. And, um, and, and still, like, they, they can invade, they can swarm into the softer interland um, because there, there is hardly much. There are towns, yes, they have to besiege them, there's a, a thing like that, but the city, the fortified place, holds out on, uh, on the sea. Um, and Thessalonica is actually like the, the symbol of this, the symbol of what you shouldn't think of, how the Ottomans, for example, did so. Did they have guns? How, what was their technical side? That's not that important. Right, that starts being important on another level, like also this time, of course, for the siege of the major cities. But the the way they actually took over the interland and reduced Constantinople to basically just an island uh, within a, a, an Ottoman sea, with the entire Rumelia and Anatolia basically had just said, okay, we prefer the Turks. Um, first of all, it tells you how they had already lost, like in 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 a broader sense without external help there wasn't really much that they could hope doing but it also happened relatively late in time because in fact uh, the westerners could do something about the whole thing and perspectively they, they wouldn't actually do it but secondly it tells you how simply the ottomans swarmed through it without any greater kind of technical capacity Right, even at sea, as they would grow challenging, as especially after they captured Constantinople, they had been just pirates. Also on land, they were, they gathered this sort of, you know, completely, uh, you know, savage peoples coming from God knows where, as uh, in part were Anatolian, uh, you know, interland people. We've seen it in the video about um, Anatolian warfare towards, especially like the end of the chronology, because we arrive. We covered the 14th century, that there's the rise, if anything, of the Ottomans. That paradoxically, in this sense, as this crazed um, uh, warriors of the faint were, sometimes even just converts, people descending from the same Byzantine subjects before. That has been the, 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 the history of many. Like, again, Anatolia had been Byzantine historically. It wasn't much uh, that, uh, aside from some local ethnic resistance, had not been Roman, or would we, con we don't consider such, right? The Zaurian revolt did happen, but you know, we're talking about one millennium before this time. But the sense is that all this world, of course, was not exterminated and replenished with Turks. Um, it was simply subjected to these new rulers, right? It got, in fact, an incredible deal of Western influence as well, which we tend to underestimate. I made it clear in the videos about Ottoman warfare that we have an idea of, again, Turks being just fully, I don't know, Central Asian, Middle Eastern style, some case. Yes, there was a background of that kind, but there is also, uh, like, it's not like we photographed what the, the Ottoman army looked like at the siege of Constantinople, of 1453 or the one of Thessalonica 1430, right? When they actually occupied uh, Thessalonica before, um, this time as we've seen today. So the uh, the greater sense of, of this is a world melting, 
right, um, giving way to, to greater force. And this other, you understand, like a power like Thessalonica, that was literally the second most important city after Constantinople within the Byzantine world, um, did not have any sort of organization anymore. They, they did not. Uh, the destructuration of the Byzantine style army historically, something that at some point precipitated um, and to especially after the Fourth Crusade, but already showing those signs of internal uh, let's say what one thing is dominating a basin and more or less remaining the, the Germanic force concentrated there, especially if you rule from Constantinople. Um, the enemies can pass. We've seen it with the Normans, with other um, um, other invaders. But and so the thing ends, and things remain more or less as they were. But especially the separation of the Byzantine world from the the Balk the one of the Balkan interland is a major issue. It had always been. It is, we've seen it with the first Bulgarian Empire. We've seen it with, um, in a sense, in fact, just at this point. Um, with the uh, the capacity of powers even like Serbia to temporarily extend their control in these various areas, because they are really different lands. They are really something else. We've seen it also in the video about Pelagonia. There are different cultures at play, and this is incredibly pronounced in Greece. Like you can hardly find this anywhere else, unless we talk about the Celtic fringe, for example, with the English especially Ireland anyway, because at this point Scotland is at least something way more, um, let's say, compact as a as a feudal state uh, than had historically been in previous sense. But let's say, uh, you, that there are so many uh, that examples that uh, can fit the contrast between a more developed era and less civilized one, but the rigid division between the Byzantine world and the, the interland is something you can date back to, uh, again, classical Hellenic times. And it's uh, at least in the same dynamic and proportion. And so um, it's really something you want to appreciate as far as the military organization as well. The, the reason why here Thessalonica, for example, does not have enough forces doesn't much seem the fact that, you know, that they ever thought to simply rely on, on the same city. That's only what defenders do. The problem is, is that, as we've seen, they lack the resources to levy a major army. And, and levering a major army uh, doesn't um, work uh, just by, I don't know, taxing the, the Mount Athos uh, monastery. You know? um, it has to do with having at least a substantial level of interland that you can use. Um, or an enormous amount of wealth and an incredibly populous city that is really involved into also the occupation of other places around, like, for example, like Venice does, but it has a much more robust, it's one of the largest cities in Europe, etc. It's, it's a completely different story. Um, but also, in Venice at this time, by the way, ha does have a, a terra firma, um, making it a regional state. Um, these ones do not have anything in the interland. How do you levy an army? Greeks islands scattered in the Aegean, that's, that's not going to work. So uh, that's why they're so dependent on the external as well. That's how Constantinople was dependent on the external as well, if you look at it in, in, the, in hindsight, like for especially the 1453. So I, can't, I don't remember which videos, excuse me, I'll check, because uh, Byzantine history playlist. I should check the 15th. Okay, well, doesn't really matter. But uh, we did talk about the end of of the Byzantine Empire, not recently. Didn't make so much on the 15th century Byzantine side of the story. Here, I think the last one was two years ago. The Byzantine cavalry man video that we mentioned before. Uh, but we had made surely I remember something. Um, yeah, I don't remember. It's not so important now. But yes, Palaiologan Byzantine aristocracy. That's that's a useful video. Well, I will 
list some of these uh, down below in the top fix comment as we do like just to indicate what is pertinent to this to this reality uh some probably i have to re-upload uh, yes there is this for example from manuel the second palaeologus to the battle of varna this is uh, exactly our time i shall re-upload that though because uh, at some point I think I should simply remake them even because I would make them better aside from the images that I have to upload that's the reason why I have to do it you can still listen to the audio so it's um, it's really it's really okay very well however for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time